In 1803, a German chemist named Friedrich Sertuner isolated the active substance from Papavir soniferum, also known as the poppy plant. He named the substance morphine. Morphine turned out to have an incredible ability to relieve pain, and in the following years the drug was administered to millions of wounded soldiers during the American Civil War. However, morphine did not only reduce pain, it was also extremely addictive. A few decades after the Civil War, morphine addiction was so widespread among veterans that President Theodore Roosevelt had to appoint an opium commissioner to restrict the use of morphine. Not many years after Theodore Roosevelt restricted the use of morphine, the Germans went at it again. The chemists at the German company Bayer created a refined version of morphine, a version that Bayer argued was less dangerous and less addictive. Bayer named this new substance heroin and even recommended this product as a cure for morphine addiction. But after a few years of prescribing heroin even to kids, doctors realized that heroin was even more addictive than morphine and that they had made a huge mistake to prescribe it so widely. The history of how our societies have approached opiates such as morphine is really fascinating and I think that that history has some similarities to the history of how we have approached the concept of markets. So what I want to do in this video is that I want to compare the history of opiates with the history of markets. As the modern nation state became the most popular mode of organizing peoples and territories throughout the world, many of these states started to develop and rely on a tool we broadly refer to as markets. States create these market tools by designing laws and institutions that enable and encourage citizens to compete against each other for the resources they need. And this market tool turned out to have an incredible ability to efficiently allocate scarce resources. It soon became clear though that while the market tool could enable growth and efficiency, the market tool was no perpetuum mobile, no pixie dust, no panacea. Without supervision, or when the market tool is used beyond its intended purposes, the market tool inevitably leads to problems. Exploitation, monopolization and financial crises, just to name a few. The United States was an eager adopter of the modern market tool and used it to great benefit, but also ended up overdosing early. Just as President Teddy Roosevelt had to rein in the use of morphine, his distant relative Franklin Delano Roosevelt, in the aftermath of the Great Depression, had to rein in the over-reliance on the market tool. Around the world, government after government learned from experience that while morphine and markets are fantastic tools, we need safety instructions. And for a long time thereafter, both morphine and markets were mainly used for their intended purposes and in accordance with their safety instructions. Then, something started brewing in Chicago. In the 1970s, a new generation of economists, led by Chicago University professor Milton Friedman, drew up a bunch of new economic theories with scientific-sounding names. According to these theories, any problems that the market tool had led to in the past were not due to overuse or lack of oversight, but instead due to underuse and too much oversight. According to this view, which became known as the neoclassical school of economics, the safety instructions that come with a market tool must immediately be shredded. Friedman's neoclassical economics were eagerly embraced by politicians such as Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher and Carl Bildt. This generation of leaders argued that whatever the state can do, the market tool can do better. Schools, healthcare, prisons, you name it, everything can be improved by creating and unleashing an unsupervised market tool. To take a few examples, in the 1980s the US government created and unleashed a market tool in the prison system. In the UK, the government created and unleashed a market tool within forensic sciences. And in Sweden, the government attempted to out Friedman the competition. The government created and unleashed a particularly monstrous market tool within the school system. Around the same time as Milton Friedman's neoclassical theories were adopted by governments around the world, the American billionaire Richard Sackler was onto something big. 
His company, Purdue Pharma, had developed a new version of morphine, a version that was twice as potent as morphine and that could be taken as a pill instead of via needle. Purdue named this drug Oxycontin. In most parts of the world, governments still heeded the morphine safety instructions. Because of its addictiveness, morphine was prescribed only for severe illness. This meant that the market for Purdue Pharma's new morphine product, Oxycontin, was relatively limited. But in the US, this was about to change. Just as the German company Bayer, a century previous, had marketed heroin as a safer version of morphine, Purdue Pharma now argued that Oxycontin was a safer, less addictive version of morphine. This strategy proved particularly successful in the US. Here, the neoclassical doctrine had secured a solid foothold. The market tool had since long turned healthcare into a profit-making factory on which pharmaceutical companies view patients as consumers and doctors as retailers, and also with government supervision limited to a minimum. This gave Purdue Pharma the opening it needed. First, Purdue successfully lobbied the laissez-faire government to let Purdue market OxyContin as a less addictive drug than morphine. Second, Purdue Pharma unleashed an army of salesmen, heavily incentivized to get doctors to prescribe as much OxyContin as possible. And over the next two decades, OxyContin would generate some $35 billion in revenues for Purdue. Some time has now passed since Milton Friedman shredded the market safety instructions and Richard Sackler shredded the morphine safety instructions. Let's take stock. As for the morphine experiments, the US is today plagued by an opioid addiction crisis that has caused half a million deaths and millions of Americans suffering from opioid addictions. This crisis took off when Purdue Pharma was given permission to make fraudulent claims about OxyContin. Claims that went against historic experiences of how opioids work. As for the neoclassical market experiments, also they took off when influential economists and politicians made startling claims about the potential of the free market tool. Claims that also they went contrary to historic experiences. You don't need to look far to find examples of how the neoclassical promise of markets has been oversold. Let's go back to our previous examples. The creation of a prison market in the US has spawned huge prison oligopolies, such as Core Civic, that offer lower quality services to higher costs. These oligopolies then spend some of their profits to lobby against any reform that would decrease the US prison population which today is the largest in the world. The creation of a forensic science market in the UK enabled the private providers to cut costs to make profits at the expense of quality, which led to a situation where years worth of forensic tests that had been used in court proceedings had to be reclassified as unreliable. And the particularly monstrous market tool that was created and unleashed in the Swedish school system hasn't led to the promised decentralization and efficiency. Instead, it has allowed digital firms to consolidate schools into huge oligopolies that push grade inflation, cause increased segregation and worsens inequality, all while extracting huge tax-funded profits for its owners. So history seems to repeat itself when it comes to how we approach both markets and opiates. But how do we stop that from happening again and again? I have three suggestions. One, when something sounds too good to be true, it probably isn't true. When someone claims to have created a version of morphine that has all the benefits but none of the downsides, then you must be skeptical. Similarly, when someone claims that an unsupervised market can unlock welfare and efficiency in new areas without any of the risks, then you should also be skeptical. 2. What's in it for the messenger? Before we create and unleash the market tool in new areas, we need to think carefully about its potential impacts. And unfortunately, the corporations that profit handsomely off of the market tools are really effective in muddying the water when we assess market solutions. When Purdue Pharma made startling claims about OxyContin, we should have taken into account that Purdue themselves stood to make billions in profits. Similarly, when someone claims that a new market tool would benefit society, we should take into account whether that person plans to profit off of that market. And three, markets are tools. 
nothing more, nothing less. Today, many perceive markets as fundamental forces of nature, similar to gravitation or evolution. But markets are no such things. Markets are cultural tools that we create with the help of our shared imaginations, our laws and our institutions. And the markets we create, they can be incredibly useful, but they can also be harmful. We decide. Either we allow ourselves to become tools for the market, or we use the market as a tool to improve the human experience. Thank you for watching this video. I had a lot of fun making it. Since you watched this far, maybe you liked this video. If you did, you would really help me out if you subscribe to my channel and share the video to someone who you think also would like it. If you want to help me make more videos like this, you can become a Patreon at patreon.com slash themarketexits. And to my existing Patreons, I just want to say thanks a lot for believing in The Market Exit and for joining me on this journey. I actually made this video a while back after I read the fantastic book Empire of Pain and you could view this video almost as a tribute to that book. Uh, if you want to know more about uh, Purdue and Oxycontin and the Sackler family, I really recommend that book. It's written by Patrick Radden Keefe. Also I made this video as part of my efforts to become better at map animations and I learned a lot by doing this video. If you want to become better at making map animations as well, uh, and you're into After Effects, I can recommend the YouTube channel Boone Loves Video. Uh, Boone has some of the best After Effects tutorials out there, in my view. Uh, so check out his channel. Alright, that was it for this time. I hope that I will see you in the next video.